And good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the eDiscovery Channel. This is Tom O'Connor from beautiful, sunny downtown New Orleans, where the crawfish are in season, the cotton's high, and the catfish are jumping, and we're we're having some fun down here. eDiscovery, what eDiscovery? <laughs> um, and I'm joined as always by my buddy Rocky Messing, who is back in you're in Tel Aviv again, Rocky. Back home, finally. Yep. There you go. Um, and he was just sharing with me his stash of cigars, which made me incredibly jealous before we started filming here. But uh, we are really pleased to be joined today by uh, uh, an old friend and colleague, uh, Dan Regard, who's the, um, I, I can't remember the name of the company. What is it, Dan? Is it, is it? Uh, <laughs> Dan, of course, is the president, CEO, founder, chief bottle washer, and, and great crawfish cooker of his own. Um, of IDS located in in Washington D.C. Dan, welcome, welcome, and great to see your face. You know, with the with the COVID thing, I haven't actually seen you for well over a year. You know, Tom, Rocky, thanks for having me here today. It's great to see both of you. Um, I feel like this is how I see everybody these days, right? I'm yeah. I'm both far away and I'm virtually right next to you. It's like that old was it George Strait? All my exes live in Texas. Yeah, <laughs> this is like transcendental travel. <laughs> Yep. Right. I am so just as a my first in-person meeting next week with someone from the industry who actually lives here in Israel, and, and uh, it is our first in-person sit down, have a coffee meeting in a year year plus. It's it's crazy. mine is going to be tomorrow at lunchtime. First actual face to face. You know things have loosened up with the protocols here, and I, I was telling telling you guys we did a big crawfish boil as a kind of a it was the would have been the first weekend of jazz fest and uh, we would have been partying anyways and um and so we did a big thing in memory of jazz fest and gale and blah 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 but we had a huge crowd about 90 percent of the people were vaccinated so it was very relaxing yeah. to, you know to have a, a social event with 75 100 people all clogging the street in front of my house like we would i, I live right next to one of the gates to the fest, uh, uh, Dan. So it's, it, you know, we that's what we would have been doing normally. But And just as a public service announcement, the city is really pushing to go forward with Jazz Fest in October. Um, my understanding is Quentin Davis is working the phones, trying to line up acts to come in and um, they're, they're, you know, knock on wood, hopefully if the, the, the COVID thing continues to, to improve, we will uh, we'll have a real Jazz Fest here in October. So, but Dan, I, I want to ask you, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. I, I, I actually recalled, you know, when I heard the uh, the sad news about uh, Robert Childers passing away uh, last yeah. week that uh, he was the one, I don't know if you recall, but he was the one who introduced us at like the first or second master's conference years and years ago. And so I remember kind the of, first master's. Uh, yeah. In Washington, D.C. at the Ronald Reagan Center. Exactly. I was one of the keynotes. Yes. I got to make an analogy of e-discovery to the enterprise. There you go. And everybody was there up on go. the bridge talking about it, and we were expected to be Scotty down there making it actually work. <laughs> In fact, we were all wearing red shirts, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also had a big uh, – so when I was a bachelor – I used to have more of those really large parties, like you're talking about, at my house in D.C. Yes. And we had a big yes. reception at yes. uh, at my house for George t for um, the Masters Conference. Yes, and I believe that's where he introduced me to you. Obviously, it registered in your memory banks because <laughs> it, it's popping I mean, up right away. Who, who could forget you, Tom? Come on. <laughs> oh. Well, there's a long list of people I wish would forget me, including my first two wives, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> At least once a month. <laughs> yeah. So, Dan, here's the question, and we were talking just beforehand. It's always interesting. We should have we should have had the, the, the camera running as we were talking about, you just mentioned the Enterprise, and we were talking about time travel and, and e-discovery. And how did you get started in this crazy business? Wow. And why? That, that, it, it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> and more to the point, why? So um, I actually got started in e-discovery without knowing that I was in e-discovery. I was in Lafayette, Louisiana, working in the uh, oil patch while I was going to school for computer science. Okay. And I got approached by someone who said their friend, a landman, couldn't get into their computer 
because they got in a fight with their secretary. She quit and wouldn't give them the password. So I, went, <laughs> I, I got into their computer. Um, and now what year was, is this, roughly? This would have been 1985. Right. Their neighbors, they were in this little uh, incubator of engineers and geologists. Their neighbors were running a software program that would uh, help them forecast the economic performance of oil reservoirs. And they needed help running their computer. So I helped them run a bunch of scenarios, not realizing they were preparing the scenarios for expert testimony. Ah. Next to them was a geologist who had an early Macintosh and was using Canvas to scan in these well logs and create the Plato looking survey of the side of the earth showing where the wells were to draw lines as to his opinion of how the oil reservoir went underneath different parcels of land. And he right. needed help with the graphics, not realizing he was preparing demonstratives for trial. <laughs> so I was working in e-discovery back in 85 and I didn't even realize it. But nice. I've been doing it ever since, helping people, <laughs> I like to say either, either helping people where the evidence is from computers or helping people use computers to manage the evidence. So you got out of school, were you going to, to ULL? Well, you it was you were a Cajun? Cajun? I yeah. absolutely am, go Cajuns. All um, right. Interesting family story there, USL used to be called the uh, University of Southwestern Louisiana. Uh -huh. SLI, Southwestern Louisiana Institute. It used to be called SLII, Southwest Louisiana Industrial Institute. So <laughs> SLII to SLI. They changed the name to USL because my grandfather was a state senator and promoted the bill, and they named one of the dorms after him. Nice. Uh, so there's a little tie in there. Then they tried to change it to UL. Then they got reversed because LSU got jealous, and now it is the UL, UL of Lafayette. Or as we like to refer to it, ooh la la. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Rocky, uh, several years ago, uh, uh, Dan and I somehow were talking about not specifically Lafayette, but more New Iberia, St. Martinville, down the parish there. And it turns out we have all sorts of friends in common. I asked one of my buddies who who's in, as he told me, he's in sugar. Um, I said, "What well, sugar? And sugar, Tommy? What does that mean? You drive a Coke truck? I don't, you know, I don't know what that means." <laughs> And you mentioned, was it your uncle who was an insurance guy down that uh, way? I just say Martinville. I had an uncle in insurance. I had an uncle who was a dentist. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy Thibodeau knew them all. You know, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a closed market down there, a closed network of people. It's really interesting. Yeah. Right. So you get out of school and then continued with. Well, uh, so I got out of uh, USL in computer science and I started consulting. Uh, down there with companies writing software, helping them do installations, setting up accounting systems. Right. Went to night school for accounting and then applied to Tulane for the JD MBA program. Ah, Went nice. to Tulane, um, met two former graduates who were running a video deposition business. They had landed the contract for every video deposition for breast implant globally. Oof. Ah. 6,000 wow. days of deposition. Wow. They had a cool software invention, a tech, a hardware invention to control video decks so you could type in a word search and, and, and cue the deck to that spot in the video. We, we take that for granted now. Right. But it didn't exist then. And I ended up rewriting the software they used to prepare all the depositions. Then we started a, a company together called Digital Process to actually scan paper, the early days of the 90s with laser fiche. And then I had, uh, wow. a, who became I, a great- I was laser fiche certified back in the day. Oh, we're yeah, not gonna way back with you. Certified, I got laser fiche to allow us to use more than one CD player. They said, why would you need two CDs? <laughs> who would have that many documents? Right. <laughs> I don't remember the woman who owned the company, but I was on the phone with her directly. And now, I, I got into the business. My connection to Laserfish is I was in, much like you, Dan, I was doing just network installs and stuff. And sometime in the mid 80s, I was in San Diego working on a, a conversion from a Wang system to Novell for a law firm. And uh, 
Uh, a guy was, did a, a regular 4th of July tech conference over at the Hotel Dell. Um, yeah. And it's, I walked over and I met Browning Marian for the first time that day. Wow. And Neil Aresti was one yeah. of the speakers doing a laser fish demo. Oh. And, I, and he, you know, I'm thinking to myself, Neil yeah. Neil Aresti, before he wrote his software up in Boston? Well, he was in the early stages of it. So it hadn't become a big thing yet because, you know, the, the Internet was still Al Gore hadn't quite fine tuned it yet to, you know, yeah. for version 5.0. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is these people are like doing really cool stuff. I got to get in on this stuff. Um, wow, so that's funny. Resty. I haven't spoken. To, yeah. He's still on my Christmas list. I love him. Yeah, I talk to him maybe once a month. He, he's a great guy. The Boston Connection, you know, we both know a lot of people in common and um He's still, I think, uh, just relaxing and doing some consulting and not a whole much, not a whole bunch. He was, in fact, I got to ask him what his, his son became a really good baseball player. He, he sold the company, was coaching his son in Little League, and then in, he went into high school and then college. And I understand that he was, you know, looking pretty good, at least for a minor league contract. But now with COVID, the, you know, Major League Baseball, like, cut their minor league teams down to about a third of what they were. Yeah. So, but yeah, I talked to him a while. All the time. It'll be back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, then what? Then you started that that company. How did how'd you get to D.C.? Well, so I'm in, I'm in New Orleans, and I'm uh, working with this company, and I graduate from law school, and I have a choice, practice law or stay in the business. And I decided to stay in the business, got involved in a large uh, antitrust matter, private sector, and developed some software for trial presentation. And then there you go. Uh, at the time, uh, went out to Phoenix. I was married at the time, took, followed my wife. She got a job at the Mayo Clinic, followed her out there to Phoenix, set up station over there, and then interviewed and got hired by Deloitte and Touche out of Los Angeles. Ah, okay. So I worked with Deloitte for a couple of years in Los Angeles, one year, and then got transferred to the New York office, worked out of New York for three years. That time joined a, a up and coming company called FTI. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Helped form the e, help run form and then run the e-discovery practice for FTI Consulting. 2002 oh. to 2004. Then I joined a small company called LECG and oh. ran their e-discovery practice nationally and expanded it to global. And then in 2008 started IDS. Excellent. Cool. And so the rest I is assume, history. I assume at this point you're you're not regretting your decision not to actually practice. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it it, it it call me on a given day. <laughs> I, yeah, I tell you, I, uh, honestly, yeah. right now I think that uh, for those of us who've been involved in the evolution and the emergence of e-discovery, uh, we have every opportunity to shape best practices, shape industry standards influence the direction of the law and help people really understand because it's a it's an intersection of law and technology and it, it, it requires both lawyers and technologists. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like in a small way, I'm obviously not officially practicing law, but I feel like I get to read it, yeah. and, and, and understand the law constantly. And because I testify a lot, uh, put our work product in terms of what the law requires so that it makes sense to the trier of fact. And you know, that's a that's a great point. Mike Arkfeld said that at a conference I, I was at with him several years ago. He said, this is really an exciting time for us because it's the true intersection of technology and the law. It's not just lawyers using a little bit of technology for support. Um, it, 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 the, the law is being shaped by the technology of the day, and the people who understand that are the ones who are pushing that forward. That's that's a wonderful point. Well, I tell you, if you like that aspect of our business, there's never been a better time to be in the business than right now, because we're about to go through a whole nother evolution of e-discovery, and it's happening right before our eyes. It's exciting. So sounds like this sounds like a PBS story. What, yeah. What's it all about, Dan? Tell us, come on, tell us. <laughs> so my theory, my theory is, for <laughs> for centuries, the primary form of evidence in court has been oral testimony. Wait, people couldn't even write 
until a couple hundred years ago. Now it's moved to documents, and the documents have taken off as our ability to generate documents has, has increased from stone to parchment to paper to typewriters in the 1800s to spirit copiers, photocopiers, computers, then email, internet, and explosion, right? What's interesting about that is oral testimony talks about the memory of what happened. Written documents talk about a recording in time, but primarily a recording by a person. We are now moving into the third age of evidence. And our new evidence is computer generated transactional data. I know more about what happens in lawsuits because of things people record as a byproduct of digitalization than because of what they record on purpose. Okay, so uh, what you're basically saying is you're you're looking at the full story being told by all of the different digital points that are Correct. captured through a transaction, through a incident, through whatever it is that's happening, and you're no longer relying on the recall of a individual or a group of individuals, but you rather have the potential to pull together everything from video recordings to, you know, audio to written records to notes that someone took in OneNote or whatever and pulling all of that together to create an actual or text that they sent. Right. Right. Or text I mean, I, I, we can we, rebuild. Again, we get back to our, our prior to the call conversation about telling the story that the this narrative. Is all all that we do is is it's all about the narrative correct and this is going to have a profound effect on the way we, we we execute projects the way we think about the dynamics of the legal industry i'm working right now with the professor to put together a paper on how this affects the financial structure in the entire legal industry and it and and how it 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 it, it builds into when we go to trial if we go to trial how we go to trial and there's a whole other parallel story, which we can talk at another time, about how the development of e-discovery, the development of discovery in 1938, is really what pushed the billable hour forward for lawyers. And if we start changing the dynamics of discovery, we get to explore alternative ways of billing for value instead of yeah. billing by time. You and I but have talked about this before, yeah. And it's, it's yeah. based on discovery, believe it or not. Those are very tangible right. theories. But yeah, so it's an exciting time of a lot of opportunity and a lot of change and a lot of new technology. So it's great. I love so, it. Yeah. I, let me ask you, though, Dan, um, one of my beefs in our business for a long time has been that software companies slash vendors are mired in the old paradigm of a paper document with a Bates number that they have recorded. Right. You know, we've you and I've had this discussion as well. Are, are you seeing any young technologists? who are taking advantage of what you just described and building software to deal with that or adapting current software. I don't want to name names, but you know, well, are, are, is the software community recognizing what you're talking about? Uh, I hope they do, but not quickly because we have been doing that and we've built <laughs> products to do that. And it's, yeah. in fact, I have a patent coming out. Uh, I just got word that the patent has been issued on a new way to store data that makes it easier to analyze transactional databases. Hmm. A really bad way to use data, you wouldn't use it for your accounting system, but a really great way to examine an accounting system. Right. To analyze. And I can push foreign databases together to allow us to tell these digital narratives. But um, it's, 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 we're gonna have to get away from the document a little bit. And, and, and what we're gonna see, I'm going to predict right now is the following. Today, we'll read 5 million documents to figure out which of the 50 stock transactions should be investigated, and then we'll investigate those 50 transactions. Mm -hmm. Right. Tomorrow, we'll examine for a lot less money, 5 billion stock transactions and tell you these are the 50 emails you need to read. So we'll let the context mm -hmm. drive the content instead of the content driving the context. Cheaper, faster, more accurate, more scalable. 
It's it's really an interesting idea because you know if you look at at the main players in the review software space over the last three four years, they've all come out with new technologies to 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 analyze specific data types and specific, um, for example, taking texts, putting them in a timeline, and to some degree trying to piece together that story of the. It went from the emails to the IMs, to the text, back to the IMs, trying to piece that together. Um, but this is this is what you're proposing as that next story is taking it even further because you're integrating now those you know structured data data types. You're integrating in the other types of data that can help to tell the overall big picture as opposed to what happened between these two people. And, and I think no one else is really looking at it that way yet, but the pieces are beginning to show up that will enable that. Everyone is not looking at it, but some people are, and we've been working on a number of cases for the last six, eight, 10 years already. We're just seeing more of them. What's really interesting is when we ask litigators, how important is it for you to know what the defendant or the plaintiff said they were doing last year? He says, it's crucial to know what they said they were doing. I said, excellent. Would you rather know what they said they were doing or would you rather know what they were doing? What they were really doing, yeah. and, and, and that's not to say that they're making anything up, but memory, you know, all of our memories fade. A year goes by, oh no, I, I said the Yankees were gonna yeah. win that World Series. I know I did. Yeah, you know? yeah, That sort yeah. of thing. Of course you um, did. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great point. Being able to actually go back again, use the time machine to go back and pin that down. Uh, but the point yeah. is, I, I think can tell you that I did say that the Ravens were going to win the, the Super Bowl last year and the year before and the year before that. So I, I can guarantee you that that is what I said. So, yes. Yeah. You've covered your bases. <laughs> uh, the point for this purpose of this conversation is it's an exciting time to be in the industry because I see uh, it's hard when you're in the middle of it because these changes can take 10 years. But right. we are in the middle of a change. And I like to uh, remember that 20 years ago, and Tom, you were there in your own conference rooms, we would go to attorneys and say, you see all this paper? Well, I got to tell you, in the future, <laughs> you're going to start seeing more of this, uh, this email in your discovery. And call me crazy, but one day you're going to have a case with no paper and just email. And they said, right. you're crazy. Yeah, you're fired. Get out of here. And today <laughs> I'm going to the same conference rooms and I'm saying <clears throat> you're going to start to see more databases in your litigation. And one day yeah. you have a data yeah. litigation that is only databases. Yeah. And the, the other factor, of course, as you know, Dan, is the volume is immense. I mean, I mean it's just overwhelming. They need a tool like the one you're describing to even begin to dive into this stuff. Well, the, 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 the issue with uh, documents, and you put your finger on it, Tom, uh, is that even with great technology, and we have some great technologies out there, whether it's better search terms or TAR1 or TAR2, or one day we'll get into uh, ontologies and tautologies, um, you still get down to some volume of documents that have human language and the cost um, curve for analyzing human language documents is flat. That that slope doesn't really change. But the cost curve for analyzing structured data is very different because once you understand what the data represents, you can scale that analysis to almost infinity for very little cost. Your cost is all front loaded. With documents, your cost is linear. With data, it's front loaded. Which means you can you 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 again you change your cross structure of dealing with these issues, and so and as and until we escape reviewing documents, our technologies which have made documents more manageable, have still lost ground because the volume has exceeded the efficiencies. So at the end of the year, you have more to do than you did at the beginning of the year. Right. <laughs> so we need to find ways to to be smarter. So if if you were mentoring or talking to a you know law school class or a computer science class of, of people who are looking to to crack into the industry, mm -hmm. um, 
what would you tell them? What, 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 what direction would you say, looking at, okay, we're in the middle of this, probably more towards the beginning of the middle as opposed to, you know, really midpoint right now. But how would you direct them in order to help enable this change to happen faster? First of all, I'd tell them to buy Apple stock, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Plastics. Uh, yeah. Plastics. 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 Uh, what would I do to help them enable? First of all, I would say um, I'm, 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 I'm writing a series of blogs right now called on, on a subject called fact crashing. How to really think about the abundance of data that's available rather than the scarcity of data. And as lawyers or as practitioners, we're taught we're dealing in a world where there's a scarcity of evidence. If we can find the right evidence, find the right, find the right document. Everybody wants the Perry Mason moment, right? The smoking gun document. Well, with databases, you don't have a smoking gun. You get a smoking trend. <laughs> and, and you don't have a single source of data. We find that, that when you think about all the things that are recording what's happening, if you wanted this conversation to be validated and verified, I have my calendar entry. I have my communications with Tom by email. I have the fact that this was done on Teams. Teams is recording the metadata around this event. Probably in my Teams account, definitely in your Teams account, you have a recording happening. But even without the recording, my computer operating system knows that I'm on Teams right now. It also knows that I'm surfing the internet and not paying attention to you. It knows all the things that I'm doing that I'm not but supposed that, to do. That's an uh, assumption that we all make, so. <laughs> my, my my watch tells me that I'm not standing up. My phone tells me where I'm located. My Wi-Fi connection on my phone validates that I'm actually at this location on this network. There's 15, 20, 30, 40 different systems that have various traces of this event happening. My problem is not finding the data. My problem is choosing the best. So and, I have And to correlating them. those, right? Well, but but first it's identify them, qualify yeah. them prioritize them so I can choose the easiest, the most rich, the most granular, and the cheapest. So yeah. I can choose from those, right? But that's a completely different mind shift from, are we going to find any data? So I compare this to uh, Old Testament issues, okay? Exactly. Moses is in the Sinai Desert, right, right around the corner from you there, Rocky, saying to himself, yeah. 40 years in the desert, I got to find water. And if water was evidence, he's the classic attorney. I can't find enough water. Okay. Noah is like, are you water? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I got too much water. I think we're moving from the Moses to the Noah, from the scarcity to the abundance. Different skill sets. Which we need that time things. machine again to go back in time. Just Dif yeah. Yeah. Different problems. <laughs> But uh, all solvable, all yep. just different, okay? So is the legal profession ignoring all this by not giving attorneys the proper training in law school? Shouldn't they be exposed to these sorts of things? I, I went to law school. Who else went to law school here? Okay. They didn't, they didn't teach me anything practical in law school. Oh, no, they of teach course you the not. history of the law. But then when you get out, you have to be- The able rule to in Shelley's case. I know the rule in Shelley's case, which has been of immense use to me over the last 40 years. Yeah, right. when you got out of law school, were you ready to write a contract? No. Were you ready to have a trial? No. Were you ready to- Oh God, no. You do anything, so- You need a mentor. Uh, th th what we've seen though in law school is at least we've identified students who have an interest or an aptitude for technology. Uh-huh. We've given them some background in e-discovery. Um, and, and that alone has qualified them, and I think it's sufficient to get a job on an e-discovery team when they go to a law firm. Yeah. Um, it would be great if they all had computer science backgrounds, sort of like a patent attorney. You can make sure they had a technology slash law integration. Right. Um, on one hand. On the other hand, the thing is moving so fast, I need somebody who's smart, not necessarily steeped in a particular technology. We, I know the, the CEO of a, of a small software company who I know said to me the other day, 
that he has hired an incredible amount of college kids who uh, are, as you said, smart, bright, eager to learn. And they were philosophy majors in college. Yeah, yeah. yeah it doesn't matter. You know, they're thinking outside the box. I hate that phrase, but, you know, they're, they're well, looking at the big picture. Look, it, 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 if you're going to be adept at programming, you don't need four years to do it. If you're not adept, four years aren't going to help you either. <laughs> but uh, you do need to be a thinker. You need to be a learner. So in, in, inquisitiveness is key. Energy and motivation is key. And obviously, integrity and reliability is key. If you can get those three, I love those employees. Okay, I, I like to call them peers. And we've had a lot of great people join our company. We've worked with a lot of great people at law firms and and the, the uh, even our competitors who we work with sometimes. Great experiences. Many people do not have a legal background by education or a technology background by education who find themselves in our field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if oh, you yeah. to talk about law students, I'm sorry? I said all the non-lawyers to get into that controversy. Non-lawyers <laughs> or non-practitioners, look at me. I, I famously yeah. practiced law for one day. Yeah, I mean, so you know. That's a whole other story. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we've established that you've got the your take on this, which I tend to agree with, is that it's all about the narrative, that the narrative, the way that we find the narrative, the way that we can actually establish what the true narrative was, is becoming more and more evident um, and more available than it was five, 10 years ago. And that new people coming into the industry who have that thought process or smart, who are able to, to adapt, are going to be able to take us further. Let's now look ahead 10 years from now. So awesome. we've now got, got this technology is, you know, your patent's out there, three other people, you've already finished your patent, patent case against them. And, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> We've told the narrative around that. Um, where, what's actually next? Meaning, okay, so we've established that technology and that the actual telling of the story by the facts, not based off of oral testimony, becomes the norm. Where does that leave the legal industry? Where does that leave e-discovery specifically within the industry? Because if that becomes the norm of what the actual attorneys are doing in trial and in pretrial and trying to set up the cases, are the people in our industry in the e-discovery side, are they just the enablers of that? They're just serving it up? Or is there room for them to keep growing, keep doing in the next 10 years? Well, we're not gonna get away from emails and documents. We just need to find better ways to manage the volumes. And as I pointed out earlier, um, using data to narrow the scope of where you need to spend your time is a very cost effective way to continue to conduct discovery against these avalanches of volumes that we see continuing to come. So. There's a very strong aspect of what we do today that we will continue to do. But we can't do what we're doing today when the volumes are 10 times or 100 times greater. Right. So what I'm talking about is an alternative to that. And, and, and what I suspect is the, the law firm of the future will look different, whether it's through affiliation or through actual onboarding resources. Today, law firms have e-discovery practices they didn't have 10 years ago. Uh, in 10 years, you're going to have law firms that have statisticians and economists that are interpreting data, or rather data scientists. Yep. We're dealing which with already beginning to see. which we're already beginning to see data scientists as part of the law firm and the trial team will be a combination of lawyers and data scientists. And again, whether it's through, by hiring through affiliation on a spot basis for a project, you know, don't forget the gig economy or whether they are members of the law firm, they're going to be part of that team. And you're going to want that and need that. I also think that this is going to allow lawyers, I hope, to personally spend less time in e-discovery and more time practicing law. Right. And going back to not 
project management, not evidence management, but actual thinking about what does the law require? What does the narrative tell me about the actions of the players? And how do we apply the law to the facts? As uh, uh, Lord Blackburn said in the 1700s, still true today, 99% of all disputes are disputes about the facts and only 1% of the disputes are disputes about the law. Well, what if we had no dispute about the facts? Imagine how we could open up the docket, clear out the backlog, make our system of justice more efficient, which in turn would open up the system of justice to people who currently are barred from it. Statistics tell us that 50% of the middle class disputes and 80% of the lower class disputes that should be adjudicated are not because of cost, delay, and, and um, complexity. If we can address that and open up courts to people who are currently kept from courts, call me a dreamer, I think we can address some of the social justice issues. But one of the problems that those people have, Dan, and you know this, um, for example, in, in Louisiana, 60% of the people north of the I-10 corridor don't have high-speed internet access. Okay, how do, do, how do all these technology changes help the two attorney firm in St. Saint Martinville improve their practice of law? So let's take a step back. The first question is, is there alternative sources of evidence for an accident that took place? And the answer is, yes, there is. There's onboard computers on the vehicles. In fact, if you get to it fast enough, the iPhone, the accelerometer is so sensitive, it could tell you if you braked or not before the accident. Right. Okay? So the first question is, is there additional evidence to help illustrate what happened for this given accident? And is there evidence that can tell us the health condition of the occupants before, during, and after the accident? Go back as far time as you want. You know, the old, I can no longer lift my hand. I can only lift it this high. How high could you lift it before the accident? Oh, before the accident? I could put it up here. Right. Um, we, <laughs> but I can tell that with your iPhone watch, with your Apple watch. I can tell where you're moving it, you know? So we have all these sources of data that actually resolve the factual dispute. But, but sorry, but Dan, almost all of these, when you're looking at, at socioeconomic uh, issues, you're, you're talking about technologies that aren't available to the masses. Well, they're becoming more and more available, but there's still there's that lag. And to Tom's question of how are we going to how are we going to use this movement of the industry to help <clears throat> the to help social justice? I, I think you're missing that piece of they need to be able to have access to it as well. And maybe, like all technology, prices start high and go down. Look, I mean, maybe look. Dan's at the at the forefront of this, and and in five years, ten years, whatever, um, this will become commonplace. In maybe in 2002, when I joined FTI, we licensed a software called Discovery Cracker from Jay Lieb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we were the first license he had. I was also the first license for. Uh, Florida Data Bank's software for scanning documents. Cool. DocuLex, right? Yeah. DocuLex. Dan, what Dan was his I, name? Uh, when, when Bailey? David Bailey. David Bailey. David Bailey. 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 Yeah. 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 But his technician what? was Neil Lawson, who became my business partner. Neil right. came ah. to New Orleans to install DocuLex at my company. We were the first company to license it and install it. The se second to license it, first to install it. Neil came to install it, and that's how I met him. And he helped me start IDS. But, I, I um, have the largest installation, though. I, I, was running, <laughs> I was running 400 computers. This is before any virtualization. 400 DocuX computers. Oh, wow. Yeah. For OCR or for scanning? For, for, it was for first for scanning, but then we, we had for OCR and we had for their e-discovery uh, product that they had come out with. Um, we had a super, it was down in Houston and we basically rented a warehouse and put out, just set up row after row after row of oh. basically five computers and with, a uh, with one monitor with a manual switch on each one. And it was insane. Yeah. Lots of fun. 
<laughs> well, so so I know, we, sorry, back to the <laughs> No, no, no. When yeah. when we when we had uh Discovery Cracker, we were pricing out projects at five thousand dollars a gig. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Tom, the price has changed. <laughs> yeah. A little less than that now. If you want that price, I can make an exception for you. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um, so so the, yeah. the, 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 so the short answer to your question, there are two parts to it. The first is, until we start using and developing the technologies, we can't drive the price down. The price is already right. coming down. Uh, right. but number two, uh, and this is a whole separate pet passion of mine, I think that e-discovery is crucial to getting justice in the courtroom. And therefore, I think pro bono is crucial to e-discovery. Oh, there two words people, lawyers love to hear, pro bono, yeah. There are people who can't afford the technologies that they need. We have a vigorous pro bono program, and we went yeah. public two years ago, uh, not to get the limelight. We went public to become a role model. We want to encourage other people. We have done a, a millions of dollars of e-discovery work pro bono, and we've even given expert testimony as pro bono. And and we need both solutions. We need the efficiencies of the oper operationalism of these technologies. We need to operationalize them. And we need to think to also do donations to those who can't afford it in its current price point. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and I commend you for that, Dan. I, I, I'd forgotten that you were doing that, but you're right. And you've been doing it for a number of years rather quietly without a lot of fanfare and you deserve a lot of uh, 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 a lot of respect for that. But we don't we don't want the respect, we want to inspire. That's what we want. We want yeah, that's... other people do the same thing. Are they? Uh I hope so. I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Rocky. <laughs> Anytime. Um, okay, Tom, we are running out of time unfortunately cuz I think this could go for like oh, I've barely gotten warmed <laughs> up. I know. Come on. Um, See, if we were in person, if this were being held, this if this were a, a meeting, say, in New Orleans, we would now turn to the clock and say, uh, you know, let's turn this off and, and pick it up down at the Palace Cafe or the Bon Ton, and, and we'd oh, talk all day. Or, or the old uh, absinthe. <laughs> the absinthe house, yes, where, where all lawyers in New Orleans can be found after noon on Friday, right? <laughs> um uh, so I know what Rocky, Rocky's teeing me up yeah. for the last question, which uh, uh, Dan, I told you was our traditional last question. If you could spend, and then we've come up, I've just been writing down the names of people we've talked about here, just, just in, you know, casually in passing. But if you could spend a day with anybody from our profession, living or dead, um, doing anything, not necessarily working on, uh, what was your phrase? Crashing data? Fact crashing. Fact crashing, right. Yes. And it fact doesn't crashing. have to be fact crashing. You could be you could be gone fishing. You could be mm. eating crawfish et etouffee at the Bonton, you, you know, whatever. Who would you who would you who would you like to spend that day with? And why? Well, first of all, it, it it's really a tough decision because I've formed so many great friendships over this yeah. career. We really have an industry where people are tight knit and enjoy spending time together. Uh, some of the people living and dead that I've had great times with from uh, Dawson Horn to Robert Childress, uh, Aaron Cruz, who I spent a lot of Aaron. time with, have a lot of fun with, uh, Tom Matson, who uh, I haven't seen recently, but we've had great times. Uh, but I, I'm tempted to go back to those who are no longer with us. And the person I really enjoyed, uh, friendly sparring with over e-discovery concepts was Judge Schaefer out of Colorado. Oh, sure. Sure. Who well, unfortunately left us, what, two years ago now? Way too soon. He yeah. was a brilliant scholar, a great um, jurist, and very generous with his time. Um, loved the, the challenge of the technology, really understood it, uh, and he was an inspiration. And he had time right. to talk to anyone. He made, you know, he didn't have time. No, he, no, made, he made the time. Yeah, he would, he would make the time. Yeah. All right. Well, Dan, thank you. As always, this is a, you know, just been a treasure. Um, you know, the, 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 the biggest 
impact on me from COVID has been the lack of live conferences where we get to see people face to face who I don't get to see on a, on a normal basis. And, and like you, you know, we, we bump into each other at ILTA or wherever, Legal Tech New York, wherever it might be, um, and, and have conversations like this. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the day that we can, I think we should just have a bullshit conference. We should call it the bullshit conference when travelers, <laughs> we, we, we all just get together and bullshit. You Why know? don't we just call it, we'll call it the boondoggle. There we go. <laughs> the, the, the boondoggle <laughs> conference. Um, of course, we'll have to hold it in New Orleans. Although, actually, if we're going to call it the boondoggle, we should do it D.C. Right? <laughs> How appropriate. But, yeah, that's really what I miss is this this sort of give and take. Talking about new ideas, talking about things that are developing. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us and share some of the stuff. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that uh, continues to play out with your uh, your fat crashing. Uh, this is fun. I love having the conversation and it could go in a lot of different directions. I hope we have a chance to do it again. Yeah, well, well, we'll have to come back for round two. Thanks again. Rocky, thanks so much. And uh, uh, we'll be talking, of course, about something other than the Ravens. Because um, <laughs> all, all I can say to that is who that. Um, and uh, that's about all we have for today from the Discovery Channel. Thanks to, uh, to our great friend, Dan Regard from IDS. Uh, this is Tom O'Connor and Rocky Messing signing off and saying, see you next time on the Discovery Channel. Bye, everybody. <laughs>